So this is the, the, the second lecture now in our three-part series on, on MVCC. Uh, last class, we spent time talking about the four major design decisions uh, based on the paper uh, that, we, that we covered, right? Concurrency protocol, how do you actually coordinate transactions? Virgin storage, where do you maintain the information about the new physical versions you create? Garbage collection, how do you clean them up? And index management. And as I said, for today's lecture, we're going to focus on the first one uh, in a bit more detail. And then on Wednesday's class, we'll discuss garbage collection in more detail. Um, for today's class, we're going to look at real-world implementations of MVC systems in the context of these design decisions, but primarily focusing on how they are going to coordinate transactions. And then um, we're also going to spend a little time talking about other aspects of their architectures that aren't you know, that don't fall directly into those four different design decisions, but they're actually important, actually, if you want to build a real system. So, um, we'll start us talking about, well, with SQL Server and Hecaton. We'll use this as a baseline to understand how they do concurrency control in their system. Um, and so we primarily focus on just old TP workloads. And then we'll look at Hyper, HANA, and Cicada. These will be derivations of, of Hecaton, or have additional optimizations either for making transactions run faster are making analytics run faster. So the way we're sort of, I'm sort of uh, setting this up is we'll spend a lot of time in the beginning to talk about Hecaton, how, how they do things, but then we, we can build upon that and say, here's how to do it even better in, in these other systems. So Hecaton came first, and these other ones came, came later. Okay? All right, so let's jump right into it. So uh, actually, quick show of hands. Who, ever, who has ever heard of Hecaton before this class? All right, well, you hang around me and my, yeah, oh, you're, you're at Microsoft. Okay, so uh, I don't. It's not called Hecaton now. Like the product isn't, I, isn't called Hecaton. It's called like In Memory Engine or something. Like Hecaton is the research name, uh, but it doesn't really mean anything. But this is what they were calling it in, internally when they were building it out. And now, if you give Microsoft money and and pay for this feature, it's it's I think it's just called the In Memory Engine. It doesn't. It's not called Hecaton anymore. But for, in academia, in the research community, we understand it to be Hecaton. So. Hackathon started as an internal incubator project at Microsoft uh, in 2008, and they were designing a, trying to build a new old TP engine for SQL Server. So at that point, SQL Server was 20 years old, right? SQL Server is actually based on Sybase. So in the 1990s, Microsoft bought, bought a license for Sybase to, make, to port it to run, run on Windows NT, and then they bought a source code license, allowed them to modify it. And, and heavily, and then you know, since then, obviously the, the two branches of code have diverged significantly. Sybase is kind of old; they had a new version come out, you know, one or two years ago, but it's pretty much almost in maintenance mode at this point. Like, no new startup is like, man, we're building on Sybase; we're super excited, right? Um, whereas SQL Server is actually pretty state of the art, right? Because I mean, Microsoft has spent a lot of time and, and, and money making it uh, better and better. In fact, that it runs on Linux now is crazy. So. At this point, 2008, we're like, you know, SQL Server's been around for 20 years. What do we need to do to make SQL Server relevant in the next 20 years? And so they end up building a, a new engine for this. Um, and the project was led by two very famous database researchers. Paul Larson was on the, on the, on the Microsoft research side. Um, he's just been around in, and been involved in many dis different database projects the last 20, 30 years. Like he invented linear hashing back in the 80s. And then Mike Zwilling uh, is a, like a, an incredible database hacker. Um, from actually from originally from the University of Wisconsin, he worked on the Shore system, which is an influential storage manager back in the 1990s. And then Microsoft hired him to go lead or be part of the effort to port Sybase to Windows NT. So he's been there since then. So they were trying to build a new in-memory engine to run transactions very quickly inside of SQL Server. And so the way to understand what Hecaton is, it's not a standalone database system. It runs as part of running inside of the SQL Server ecosystem. The reason why they did this is because, you know, they had 20 years of people building applications for SQL Server, not just applications running, but also tools to help manage SQL Server. So you don't want to throw all that away just because you have a new, new, new system. So they had to build it to work inside of, of the existing uh, SQL Server uh, architecture. And this is very common in the major database system, system vendors. Right? So Oracle, IBM uh, sort of do the same thing. They have sort of special th engines you can buy, give them money for, that run inside of the core system to do something, make something run faster. The, one of the key design decisions that they had to make uh, in designing Hecaton is that they wanted to make sure they supported all possible O2E workloads. 
with predictable performance. Now, for the, the papers we're going to read this semester for transactions, we're not really looking at really kooky ideas or really um, uh, ideas that only work for a narrow class of workloads. So if you took HDOR or took, took the intro class last semester, we talked about HDOR and VoltDB. VoltDB works really well if your transactions look a certain way, right? And if your transactions don't look the way that VoltDB wants, you're going to get terrible performance. So in the case of SQL Server, they couldn't go down the, to the route that VoltDB went because if you want to be able to say, here's this engine you can pay for and run faster, but you, you, know, you might be the unlucky one that, that you know, the application that gets slower, you don't want to, you can't, that's hard to sell a product like that, right? You're, if you don't know whether you're going to get faster until you buy the product and switch over to use it, that's a terrible, that's hard to sell that. Right? It's like, hey, look, I have this car, it's going to be really fast, but you might get cancer uh, if you drive it. No one's going to buy that, right? So they want to predict performance, so they, they didn't go down the route of, again, doing this single threaded partitioning. They want to make sure that you got at least some improved performance for all applications, even though it might not be the huge gain you would get in something like VoltDB. So the way they're going to do MVCC is that uh, they're actually going to assign transactions to timestamps. So you're going to get a, tra tra it's going to be, uh, well, we're going to cover the OCC version, but you're going to get the timestamp when your transaction starts. That's your begin timestamp. And then you get a second timestamp later on. That'll be your commit timestamp. Right? And then the tuples themselves, just like we talked about with in, for MVCC and snapshot isolation, they're also going to have two timestamps. They're going to have the begin timestamp and the end timestamp. Right? So the begin timestamp is going to be the timestamp, the begin timestamp of the active transaction that created it, uh, or the, the commit timestamp of the transaction that, that created it. The end timestamp is going to be the combination of either the begin timestamp, the action transaction that created it, the, the next version in the, in the version chain, infinity, meaning it's the, the latest version, uh, or the commit timestamp of the committed version, tr committed transaction that created it. So this one's sort of easy to understand. This one's a bit uh, more nuanced. So let's actually go through an example and see how this all fits together. So here's our simple database. We have one, one logical tuple A, and right now we have two versions, A1 and A2. Again, so the begin timestamp and the end timestamp specify the visibility of this tuple based on the timestamp. So this tuple, uh, this version of A is visible between 10 to 20 exclusive. And then there's a, a pointer to the next version, uh, A2, which is visible from 20 to infinity. So this A2 is the latest version. So what are they doing? Newest to oldest or oldest to newest? Oldest, oldest to newest, right. All right, so now uh, our transaction comes along. And the very beginning, we'll assign it begin timestamp. So let's say this transaction gets begin timestamp 25. And so it's going to do two operations. The first operation wants to do a read. So again, we're going to use the begin and end timestamp to determine which version of A is visible to us based on our begin timestamp. So we start at the very beginning. We can ignore how we got to the head of the version chain. Whether there's an index or not, it doesn't matter. The protocol still works the same. So we land here in A1. We check to see, is 25 in between 10 and 20? The answer is no, so we follow the pointer and come down to the next one. Is 25 in between 20 and infinity? The answer is yes. So this is the version we read. Right? So that, that, we covered that last class. That's pretty straightforward. All right, now I want to do a write. Same thing. I land to the head of the version chain, and I want to find what is the latest version uh, I want to write, write my, or pen my new version afterwards. Right? 10 and 20, that's not us. Uh, 20 to infinity. We know that this is the latest version because this is set to infinity. So there's nothing else that comes behind it at this point. So the first thing we need to do to create a new version here is that we actually have to create the version. Right? We, we would allocate some space in memory, right? get a free slot. Uh, we're doing append-only storage, so it's going to be in the same table space as, as the other versions. And then we fill in all our new information here. So at this point, though, for the uh, begin timestamp, we're going to use this sort of special marker to say transaction at 25. All right, this is me indicating that this is a special begin timestamp that corresponds to an uncommitted transaction. So really what they're essentially doing is they're using one bit, at the, the, the most significant bit in the, in the timestamp. It's either one if it's uncommitted or zero if it is committed. So at, at transaction at 25 is me saying to you that it's been marked as a special uh, timestamp to say this is from an uncommitted transaction. Let me take a guess why you want to do this. Yes? So he says to prevent readers from reading uncommitted version. Yes, but if, it, if I didn't have that special bit, I could go look in a, in a global map 
to figure out whether it's committed or not. So just by setting that bit, I don't have to do that check. So they're, they're avoiding one additional lookup by setting that bit. So you're right, it, 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 it prevents you from reading something that's uncommitted, but actually Hackathon will allow that. We'll see that in a second. But it's just avoiding having to go check whether it's committed or not. Yes? At the same time, uh, because of this, you have to have the transaction ID space, right? Because you lost one bit. So, so your, your statement is that the, the, transact, the, the, the size of the transaction ID domain is now smaller because you lose a bit. Yeah. Yes. So you just wrap around, okay. like we talked about last class. Okay, so that happened more frequently. Yeah, but th these are actually 64-bit numbers. Oh, okay. So yeah. right, it's not as bad as Postgres with 32-bit. Okay. Yeah. OK. So we create the version first. Then we update the pointer to now point to our new version. right? Now at this point, is this tuple visible? This version visible? Why? Why not? Because you still have an end timestamp as infinity. Exactly. This, he says because you still have an end timestamp as infinity. So he's actually right. So now if anybody comes along and tries to look this up, they will see that 20 to infinity and say, well, this is the version that's actually visible to me, and they don't follow the pointer. right? So now, once I created the version, updated the pointer, now I flip this to be my begin timestamp. And now this point, the tuple is visible. So the main thing I want to say here is the, the order that we do this has to be correct. Right? It has to be done in the right order. We just can't flip this and then try to create the version and update the pointer. Because someone could end up following uh, the pointer and it points to nothing. So we create this version. Then we do an atomic compare and swap on this pointer and try to point to our new version. If that fails, then we know that somebody else wrote to create a new version before we did, and we have to abort ourselves and roll back. If we succeed, then we know that nobody else can create a new version, because we got there first. And then now we can just do an update on this. It doesn't have to be an atomic compare and swap. All right? All right, so now we're done for this on the right. And now our transaction wants to commit. So now we get a commit timestamp. So the only thing we need to do at this point for this example here is we have to go back and now update our end timestamps that we or begin and end timestamps here, which we use for the begin timestamp of our transaction to now be the, the commit timestamp, 35. So we're going to do this after we do validation, which we'll talk about in a second. So after we know this transaction is safe to commit, uh, there's no other conflicts with any other transactions, then we go back and flip these guys. And now for this case here, this doesn't have to be atomic because, as I said before, if we have this special timestamp like this that tells us this is from an uncommitted transaction, well, in this case here, I've created a new version. Uh, all these time ranges are, are correct, so I should be reading this. So to figure out whether I'm allowed to read this or not, I can go look in the, in, the, in the state map for this transaction and say, is this guy active or committed or not? All right? All right. So let's rewind now. And let's, uh, I, don't, I don't know how else to convey that we're going to go back in time. But we're going to roll back our example here but to be before we try to commit. And we're going to introduce another transaction. So again, we, we got rid of the commit. We, we roll back th these timestamps here to be our special begin timestamp for this transaction. And now we have a, another thread comes along, and he wants to start a transaction at timestamp 30. So say the first thing he wants to do is read on A. Same thing, start the head of the version chain. 30 is not in between 10 and 20. 30 is not between 20 and 25. So we get to here, 25 and infinity. So this is the version that we want to read. But at this point, the transaction has not committed. So Hackathon is going to allow for what are called speculative reads. We're going to assume that the transaction that created this version is going to commit successfully. So rather than uh, aborting ourselves, because we try to read something that hasn't committed yet, or rather than stalling to wait to find out what this transaction is committed, we're going to go ahead and allow, allow ourselves to read it. And then we'll do some extra work, in the, which I'll talk about in a second, where we, we go to make sure that when we try to commit, we make sure that the transaction that we read from, actually, whether they committed or not. All right, so now I want to do a write on it. So, Head here, A1, uh, not between 10 and 20, or 30 is not between 10 and 20. Then I land here, uh, 30 is not between 20 and, and 25. But then I land here, and now I have, a two, I'm trying to write to a new version after a version from an uncommitted transaction. So this essentially would be a write-write conflict in, in uh, when we want to do validation. So in Hackathon and every other system we'll talk about for today, 
they are not going to allow for write-write conflicts. And so they're going to do a simple policy called the first writer wins. So in this case here, we would land and recognize that we try to create a new version after this one, but this, this version is not committed. We will abort ourselves because they got there before we did. So this is going to make your life way easier in terms of implementation and what things you have to check if you don't allow for write-write conflicts and you say the first writer wins. Right? You could do more nuanced policies like the second writer wins or the you know, who, who, has, who has written the more stuff first before you get to there. All that like, uh, yes, you may get better for some applications, but the engineering cost of that is, is not worth it. So the simple policy of the first writer wins is the way to go. All right, so any questions at a high level of how we're doing transactions here? Yes? Uh, for the transaction that begins at timestamp 30, yes. uh, should he read, read version A2 or A3? Uh, for, for at this point here, for read A? Yes, because um, 30 is between 20 and transaction at 25. It's not. 30 is after 25, right? Right? The, the at thing is just me telling you that it's, it's a flag in the first bit that says this is uncommitted. So we just treat this as a regular timestamp though, 20 to 25. Right? And we allow to speculate read this, right? And then we keep track that we read it and we want to find out later on whether the transaction specified by this timestamp, whether they commit when we try to commit. Yeah, so we are not treating the timestamp transaction at 25 as a very large number. Uh, your question is, we're not treating, oh, yeah, so this is just, again, this is just a, uh, for illustration purposes. The timestamp that we would evaluate against is, is 25 here. Okay, okay. But I'm just marking this to say this is uncommitted. Okay, got it. Okay, yes. So if you do a speculative read, and, uh, are you blocked from committing or anything? Yeah, so this question is, if I do a speculative read, am I blocked from committing to, to this transaction commits? Uh, yeah, until you know whether it abort or not. Correct, yes. So he's, yes. So if you do a speculative read, we'll see this in a second, I have to mark that I read something from a transaction at 25 that did not commit. Before I'm allowed to commit, if I'm running with serializable isolation, I have to make sure that they commit. If I'm running it read uncommitted, who cares, right? I'll just read whatever I want. All right, cool. So let's talk about the, tra the transaction state map. Uh, and again, this, I'm going over this because we'll see now when we talk about Hyper and, and other systems, they do this in, in, different, in a different way, right? So again, the, 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 in addition to maintaining all the version information about the tuples, we're also going to maintain sort of the, the status, the status of, of transactions. And so at the global level, we have this map that basically says, for every single transaction that's running in the system, what is its current state? What is it doing? Right, so the very beginning, you're in the active state, right, because we're, we're in the process of, of, of executing queries that are read-write tuples. Then when the application says, I want to commit, then you enter the, val the validating phase. And this is where the system is going to use a bunch of information that it's collected during the active state to figure out whether you're allowed to commit or not, whether, whether you're, you would violate serializable, uh, serializable ordering. Then once we pass validating phase, then we enter the committed phase. So the transactions fit, finish, we're not going to execute any more queries, and we, we, we've completely been validated, but now, and now we need to go back and update all those versions that we uh, touched when we were, we were executing before, and flip their timestamps now to be our new commit timestamp. So at this point here, this is where I was sort of saying, you, could, you would recognize that if I do a read on a tuple and I see that it has the, the uncommitted transaction timestamp, I can now go do a lookup in my, in my, this state map in the system and check to see whether it's actually been committed or not. So if it's been committed, then I know it's not a speculative read. It's just the thread hasn't, got, the other thread hasn't gotten around to flipping that timestamp yet. Right? And then once I update all my timestamps or all the versions that I modified, then I enter the, the terminated phase. And then at some period, there'll be a timeout or, or TTL and, and my entry will be removed from the, from the map. Right? So again, we maintain this for every single transaction. It's a way for other threads to figure out what's going on with other, other transactions that are running at the same time. So let's go through the life cycle now of, of a transaction. So on one side, we're going to have events, you know, what happens when a transaction executes, right? what, what, is it telling, what is it telling the data system it wants to do, and then we'll have the phases we enter based on the state map. Right? So we start with the begin. Uh, again, we get the timestamp, begin timestamp for our transaction, 
if we add entry into the, the state map to say we're, we're, now, we're now an active transaction, then we go through the normal processing of, of you know, executing read-write queries. And for here, in addition to updating all the version information that I just showed in the, the two slides ago, we're also going to maintain some metadata about the transaction, about what tuples did it read, what tuples did it write, and what scan operations or scan queries did it perform. Because we need that to go do validation later on to figure out what we actually read and see whether we're, you know, somebody else had did something that would violate serializable ordering. Then we get the commit message from the transaction. We enter the, the, the pre-commit phase. We get a commit timestamp for our transaction to go through the validating process of using the information that we have from the, during the normal processing to figure out whether we've, uh, we, we've violated serialized ordering or not. So we go, the only thing we need to do is validate the reads and scans. We don't have to validate our writes because, again, first writer wins, so there'll never be a write-write conflict. So we really only care about what data we read. So if now we valid, pass our validation, we can then append uh, all the new version information for the, the things we created to our redo log and flush that out the disk. Then we set our transaction state to committed, go back and update all our timestamps, right, to update the begin timestamp in the new versions or commit timestamp in the older versions. And then we set, we set ourselves to be terminated and remove ourselves from the map. Right? So this is the standard life cycle of, of, of any transaction that goes through the, the normal commit process. If you abort, you basically uh, don't do anything beyond this because you just blow away all the old versions. Uh, do you have to go update the old timestamp? Yeah, you got to update any timestamp that you flipped uh, from older versions um, and make sure that anybody that maybe read something that you wrote, they, they get aborted as well. All right, so I want to spend more time now talking about what's happening here and here, right? What do we actually need to maintain to do, to do this step here? Again, because this will be different when we talk about what Hackathon does, or sorry, what Hyper does, and with what Cicada does. So for every single transaction, we're going to maintain in a, a local context that's specific to our one transaction, um, the read set, the write set, and the scan set. So the read set is just a pointer to every single version uh, that I read or emitted to a query. So what I mean by that is, say I have a query that does a select on A, but I, I had to go scan through three versions. My reset doesn't contain all three versions. It only contains the one that I ended up returning as the result for the query. Because I don't care about all the older versions because they're already already committed. Like There can only be one uncommitted version of a tuple, and that's really the only thing I care. I care whether I read that or not. Right? And we get that, that's an advantage of having first writer wins because there are not going to be multiple uncommitted tuples. There can only be one. For the write set, it's just pointers to the versions that I updated, uh, that I updated in the old and new, versions I deleted, or versions I inserted. And we need this, not for validation, but to go back and update their pointers later on after we, we've been committed. Right? It's just metadata to figure out what, what we actually modified. The scan set, the way to think about this is that it's the the bare minimum information you need about the query in order to re-execute the, the scan operation. So let's say I have a select query that does, you know, has some kind of UDF that does some kind of complex comp calculation in the projection list. I don't care about any of that. I only care about what's in the where clause because I want to go back and re-execute the scan on validation to see whether I scanned, uh, whether I read the same tuples when I scanned again. Is that clear? Right, and you're not storing the actual SQL string because that would be stupid. It had to, you know, to do validation to, to parse and then plan that query all over again. It's like you store the 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 the, the access methods in the query plan that allows you to go back and, and re reapply the, those operations from the where clause. So again, it's the bare minimum information you need in order to re, re execute every scan to see whether you get the same result each time. And the last one is commit dependencies. Think of this as just a linked list inside of our transaction of the, the list of the transactions that are waiting to see whether we committed. So think about it. it when I, I do a speculative read, I, I, I see the, the begin timestamp of an uncommitted version, and I know what transaction created that version. So then I go find their handle in, in, in the global map and say, give me the transaction context for this transaction, find the commit dependencies, and append myself to the list of waiting transactions. And then when this transaction goes and commits, it's almost like a pub sub system where it now goes back and notifies all the transactions that are waiting for it to find out whether it committed or not. And then based on that, they can determine, oh, I'm, I now know it's, it's time for me to go commit as well because I've, I've, all the transactions I, I was waiting for have finished. 
All right, so in Hecaton, they're actually going to support both the optimistic and pessimistic uh, versions of, of ex uh, concurrency control. So I think they implemented both of these for, the, for, you know, for sort of the research paper. I think if you download Hecaton with, with SQL Server now, I think you only get the optimistic version. So for the optimistic version, the way we're going to do validation is that we just need to check whether our, the, the version that we read is still visible to us. Um, at the end of our transaction, and then we repeat our index scan using the, the, the scan set that I talked about in the last slide. Right? Again, that just checks to see whether there's any phantoms or not in any, any scan query. For pessimistic uh, transaction or concurrent control, they're going to do shared exclusive locks on uh, individual records and, and buckets. We don't really talk about this, but the way hackathons actually organize uh, the actual table itself is through a hash table. So you can take bu locks on, on buckets to avoid um, to avoid phantoms that way. You don't need to do any validation, and they're doing basic deadlock detection with a background thread. So this is the only graph I'm really going to show for Hecaton. Uh, you know, the paper's from, I think, 2012 or 2013, so it's, it's a pretty old system at this point by, the, by standards we're talking about today, um, at least running on old hardware. The main thing I want to point out here is that uh, the difference between the optimistic version and the pessimistic version. So you, obviously you see is that you increase the number of threads, you get better parallelism in, in the optimistic version. Right, this is a small database. There's only got 1,000 tuples. But 80% of the transactions are doing reads. 20% of the transactions are doing, are doing updates. So again, as you increase the core count, increase the parallelism and concurrency in, in, in the system, the optimistic version does better. So this gap here may not actually seem like a lot in terms of like in relative terms. But in absolute numbers, this is actually pretty massive here. So we're already doing 1.5 million transactions a second. So this one, this gap here is about 300,000. To put this in perspective, because we've done experiments on MySQL and Postgres and Oracle, right, on roughly the same hardware, these guys can maybe do 30,000 to 100,000 transactions a second. So, right, you're, they're already up to 1.5 million. That's pretty significant. And to get a difference between by 300,000 is, is a lot. Now, they're not doing logging. They're not doing much extra crap here that like, the full systems actually do. But this is a pretty high number here. Right. Um, so we'll see this, you know, later on th throughout the semester. You know, people run TPCH, people run TPCC. A good way to ground yourself, and I'm trying to understand what uh, whether the numbers that we're reporting are amazing or not, just sort of have a basic understanding of what my SQL and Postgres can actually do. Uh, and to a lesser, you know, to, to some extent, also too with the commercial guys. And I'll try to say, all right, here's what the numbers are for their experiments. Here's what a real system can actually do. So this is a lot. Right? But they might just be running entirely in memory. All right, so what are the lessons we can take away from Hecaton? So they point out two major things. So the first one is that they argue that you should only use lock-free data structures. Um, and it's not just for, for indexes, it's really the entire architecture of the system should be predicated on lock-free algorithms, lock-free lock data structures. So that means for indexes, transaction maps, uh, memory allocation, garbage collector, any kind of internal thing that we're maintaining in the system. Uh, I actually disagree with this. Um, you will see it, we're, we're going to read a paper next week on the, the lock-free or lat-tree data structure we built here at CMU called the BW tree, which actually came out of the, the Hecaton project. Um, it gets crushed by regular indexes using traditional latching methods. Um, so for other things, sure, for, for internal data structures, lock-free might be right the way to go. But for the index, uh, this, I think they're actually wrong here. Um, the MemSQL guys are super big on skipless. Right, because the, the co-founder of MemSQL was at Microsoft when they were building Hecaton, saw some early discussions or early presentations done at, C at the SQL Server team about how great skip lists are or lock-free data structures are when they were building Hecaton. So he then left, went off to Facebook, and, and later formed a MemSQL and borrowed a lot of ideas from the Hecaton project. So he saw all the early talks from Paul Larson and Mike Zwilling about how great skip lists were, missed the second half of the talks where they say skip lists are, cr are terrible, uh, and then Microsoft built the BW tree. Um, and we'll see the paper you guys read next week. Both of these get crossed. Skip lists are the worst, right? There's no reason to, I should be careful here. <laughs> There's very, there are very small use cases where skip lists are a good idea for, 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 for general purpose database indexes. Um, BW trees, again, they'll lose to a B plus tree. And then the, the, the radix tree, the tries stuff crushes all of these things. Um, the, the other point they point out, which actually is, is valid, is that 
you want to minimize the number of uh, coordination or serialization points within the system. So in the case of Hecaton, it's really just at the beginning of when you have to go get the begin and commit timestamps of transactions. Right, because you have to have a, you have a global counter that everyone needs to do an atomic compare and swap to increment to get the new new timestamp at very high uh, 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 parallelism levels. That can actually become a bottleneck. You can alleviate this with some of the batching techniques that you guys read about uh, in the in the abyss paper. Um, but in general, this is always a bad idea because it can this has just become a single bottleneck. And we'll, I don't think I covered this in the hyper paper, but they. When every transaction starts, they have a, a, a single latch that everyone has to acquire as well, and that become that can become an issue. All right, so what are some observations we can make about Hecaton? Actually, before we go ahead, any questions about Hecaton? As I said, it, at this point, I mean, it's all relative terms. It's only a you know, seven, eight-year-old system at this point, but we're using this as the baseline for understanding in-memory MVCC. And then now we can jump on and say, well, what are some of the limitations are for Hecaton, and how can these other systems improve it? Yes? Can the validation space have cyclic dependencies because your lights are depending on the trees and what is happening? So this question is, can the validation phase have cyclic dependencies because your rights could be dependent on uh, other transactions? And I guess what you're saying is, like, I write something, you speculate read it. Yeah. Uh, you write something, and I speculate read it. Could, could that be a cyclic dependency? Um, Yes, and the way you would handle that through validation is you would look at the begin timestamp and say who should get preference. Do you have to break it? Let me think. Sorry. Yeah. Reading by your begin timestamp, wouldn't one not read? Yeah, yeah, the absolutely. Yes, yes, sorry, yes, 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 he's right. So if you're reading based on the begin timestamp, if I'm ahead of you, I, you can't read anything I wrote. So that can never happen. You start, you start at timestamp one, I start at timestamp two. You wrote something. I can read it. I write something. You can't read it. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, when you're getting a timestamp, um, could you not avoid using comparing swap but using atomic add? Same thing. Yeah. Sorry. So the statement is: instead of using compare and swap, can I use atomic add? Yes. I C compare and swap is a broad class of instructions. Atomic add is the same thing. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, there, there'll be an instruction that is an atomic add. I'm, I'm using them as, as a class of instructions. I'll, I'll be more careful, yes. OK. All right, so what are some observations we can make about Hackathon? So the first is that the, the rescan set validation that I talked about is fine for the kind of workloads that Hackathon was focused on, like O2B workloads, where transactions don't touch a lot of data. The scans aren't very big. So that's fine for, for, for that, those, those applications, those queries. But if you want to do analytical queries, then this is going to become problematic. Right? Say I want to do OLAP query that's going to scan the entire table right? and compute someone to aggregate. Now in my read set, I have to maintain a pointer to every single tuple that I read. If I have a billion tuples, I have a billion pointers. So that sucks. Same thing with the scan set validation. Right? If I have to scan the entire tuple or table twice, because I do it the first time when I run the query, then I have to do it again when I do a validation. That's you know, you're doubling the latency of the system, of the, every query, because every query takes twice as long because you're executing it twice. So that sucks. The other issue is now that the, uh, as we append new versions to, to our version chain, that's going to hurt performance for these for the analytical queries, because now I'm going to have to have all this, this, uh, this um, non-determinism in my execution of the code because I have to follow the version pointer and figure out you know, what version I should actually be reading as I scan along. And that's going to have, mis uh, the CPU is going to have more branch mispredictions. That's going to flush my instruction pipeline. That's going to make everything uh, really, really slow. The, the last issue is that the, uh, in the way that we were doing conflict detection in Hecaton was just on the mere existence of a tuple. Right? Did I read something that you wrote? But it doesn't actually look at to say whether the thing that you wrote is actually something I read, and therefore I may have a conflict. So what do I think about this? If I, I have a thousand attributes, a thousand columns in my single tuple, my updating transaction updates one of them, my read transaction reads the other 999 of them, I actually didn't read anything you wrote, so therefore I shouldn't really conflict. So in Hecaton, they can't handle that because they're just looking at pointers. 
Whereas we can do something more sophisticated and actually look at what the operation actually was that of what you read and what you modified to determine whether you have a conflict or not. So this is what Hyper does. So as I said, Hyper is what our system is currently based on now. Uh, we threw away all the code and we, we took this paper you guys read and actually built our system to be very similar to it. Um, so this is going to be a column store MVC system that supports Delta record versioning. They're going to go newest to oldest version chains. Um, anytime you do an update uh, on a non-index attribute, you just update in place. If you want to do an update on a non or index attribute, you have to treat that as a delete followed by an insert. It's the same thing we talked about last class for primary keys, but I think they do it for all, for all indexes. The key thing that makes Hyper completely different than everyone else is the way they're going to do validation for serializability. So they're not going to do any scan checks. They're not going to do uh, any, any locking on individual tuples, like in our two-phase locking. They're going to do a technique uh, called precision locking, which is going to look a lot like predicate locks, but actually not fully implemented the same way predicate locks are. So just like in Hecaton, they're going to avoid write-write conflicts by allowing the first writer to win. So let's look at a high-level overview of, of, the, of the architecture. So we're going to have our main data table. And again, Hyper is a column store. So all the, the values for a single attribute will be stored together in a contiguous block of memory. But then they're also going to maintain a separate column called the version vector. And the version vector is going to be a 64-bit pointer to the head of the version chain uh, stored in, in the delta storage space. So if there's a pointer exists, then it's pointing to a version. If, it, if it's the pointer is null, then whatever is in here in the main table space is considered the latest, latest version. Right. So now within the delta storage part, uh, just like we talked about before, we're going to organize it on a per transaction or per thread basis. So rather than having a global rollback segment or glo global delta storage space where every single time I, I want to create a new version, I have to acquire a slot for, you know, from that space and then you know, write, do my write into it, every thread has its own uh, uh, local memory that it can append these new versions into as needed. And then, I, and, and then if other transactions want to come along and reconstruct the right version going back in time, they just scan along these pointers into to, you know, to the, my memory region and reads, reads, reads whatever versions I've created. All right? So at a high level, this is basically how, how it works. So this part is actually not that novel. right? This, there's other systems that do this. What makes Hyper really interesting is the validation part. So I've already said this before, first writer wins. Right? The version vector always points to the latest committed version, um, and we don't need to worry about the, whether, the, um, whether the, the, the right, there's conflicts between two different writes. Because right? the first guy would try to do right, realize it can't flip the, the pointer that it wants to append the new version to, and therefore it, 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 it knows there's a conflict and it rolls back and aborts. But now, when a transaction goes to commit, the way we're going to do validation is that we're going to check all the delta records that were, that were created by transactions that committed after our transaction has started. And you, we want to see whether they modify the database in a way that conflicts with any query that we ran. Right? And again, the reason why we only have to check transactions that started or that are committed after we started, because again, under snapshot isolation, if they had committed before we started, we would have seen their rights any, you know, no matter what. And it's only the ones that, that committed after we started. We don't care about ones that commit after we commit because we weren't around to see them. Who cares? Right? So the way they're going to do this is super cool, is, is a technique called uh, precision locking. So what's crazy about this is that this paper is from like before I was born. It's like from 1980. Before this hyper paper came out, it had like 45, 40 citations. So like a 30-year-old paper had 30 citations. It's basically completely forgotten. And then the German dudes working on Hyper dug it out somehow, like, oh, this is exactly what you want, and this is what they end up implementing. Nobody else, as far as they know, has ever done this on precision locking until these guys found it. It's awesome. So what's awesome about this, again, the only thing we need to store now is just, again, the read predicates, uh, just like the scan set we saw under, under Hecaton. We just need to keep track of those things for our transaction. And then we don't need to keep track of anything extra, uh, anything sort of additional or special from any of the committing transactions other than the delta records, which, which we were creating anyway. So we're reusing the delta records we're already generating to run transactions in the first place to figure out whether we, we, we uh, uh, to figure out whether we're serializable or when we do validation. So let's look at an example here. 
So say this is our transaction. This is the one we want to commit. So it executed three queries. And then over here, I have three transactions that have committed since this transaction, after this transaction started. So what we need to do now is we're going to go look at each uh, query one by one and look at the where clause and compare that against the values of the, the attributes that were modified within the transaction and see whether those, those predicates evaluate to true. If they do, then we know that th these transactions created a version that we should have seen, but we didn't because we ran under snapshot isolation. Right, so say this first example here. The where clause is where attribute 2 is greater than 20 and attribute 2 is less than 30. So essentially we go look in, in, the, in the delta record and say, oh, I see that you're modifying attribute 2. Right? So this is the undo record. So, so when this transaction ran, it set attribute 2 to 33 and it set attribute 2 to 99. Right? So we go now and substitute the, 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 I guess the placeholder or the, the, the pointer, if you will, inside the SQL query for this, the name of this attribute with the actual value that they put in into it, right? So now instead of being attribute 2 greater than 20, it's 33 greater than 20 or 99 greater than 20. And then we just run the predicate like we normally would when we evaluate expressions, when we execute queries, and see whether it evaluates a true or false. In this case here, 33 is greater than 20, false. Um, or sorry, 33 is less than 30, that's false. And 99 or 99 is less than 30 is false. So both these evaluate to false. So we know, again, that this tuple, this transaction did not create a version that we should have read, but we didn't when we ran the first time. Go to the next one. Attribute 2 in 10, 20, 30. So we check to see whether either 99 or 33 is either 10, 20, or 30. Both of these are false, so therefore we, we, this thing didn't create a version that we should have seen, and so we skip that. Same thing for this one. This one references uh, attribute 1. This tuple, or this, this transaction, did not modify attribute 1. Therefore, attribute 1 is not referenced in the delta record, so we replace the, the, repla the placeholder for attribute 1, which is null. And null like you know, uh, wildcard ice wildcard is always false because null compared to anything else is false. Right? So we do this down the line for all the other uh, aware clauses, uh, for all the other queries and, and rest of the, the transactions, till we get this last one here. Again, attribute 1 like wildcard ice wildcard. So in this case here, this transaction created a delta record where they modified attribute 1 and set some value to ice cube. So in that case here, this predicate will evaluate to true. And therefore, we know, again, that this thing, we should have read this version, but we didn't. So therefore, we, we abort our validating transaction um, and roll back into changes. Because again, that would violate serializable ordering. So is this clear? So why don't, yeah, sorry. So you mentioned that uh, all the transactions that started after validation started? Right? Uh, no, so these guys here are transactions that committed after I started. After you started validation? Like, no, 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 after I started, started. Oh, after you started, started. Yeah. Okay. So can that, can that list set a transaction to zero? The statement is, can't this list of transactions that have committed after I started, can't that just keep growing and growing? Uh, I mean, if, if the validating transaction takes an hour, yes, this thing can keep growing and growing, right? Most OTP transactions don't take an hour, right? Most of them, the, the most common scenario is like I update a small number of things in a few milliseconds and, and, and commit, right? The bulk update stuff we talked about in the, when we talk about transaction models, those are rare corner cases. The common thing is that most transactions do a small bunch of updates and commit right away. So yes, in theory, this thing could be huge, but in practice, no. Yes? Is there only one transaction validating at a time? This question is, is there only one transaction validating at a time? Uh, in the actual implementation of Hyper, yes. The dirty secret about Hyper, and probably doesn't come out in the paper, is that it's actually single-threaded execution for write transactions. So in that case, yes. In practice, though, uh, Because while you're validating, there can be other transactions validating, and they can commit. And you might skip something. Yeah, so his statement is, if I'm validating and some other transactions commit while I'm continuing to validating, uh, if, those transactions, um, if those transactions started before I started, then I, I need to go check them. If they started after I started, then I don't. 
So what you could do is you basically say, again, you know what actor transactions exist in the system, and you could stall this thing to say, uh, wait until you find out about all transactions that are still running that started before me, if you wanted to handle that. Uh, otherwise, you could say, otherwise, again, first writer wins. So if my guy gets through, I finish my validation, and there, there are still transactions that, uh, there are still transactions that were active at the time I started, and they wrote something to something that I didn't read, then that's okay because they would get a timestamp after I committed. They would get commit timestamp would be after I finish. So I wouldn't have seen it anyway. So that's fine. Yes? So I'm still confused. What's the difference between uh, the latest value and then this transaction? So if you go back like two slides before, uh, so yeah, this one. So this? So what's the difference between ISD and DID? So his question is, what is the difference between, like, say for this this version here? So the version of ISD and DID, what's the difference? Uh, so the, like this is one tuple, ice, ice T yeah. 200, that's one tuple. All right, and then the latest value is 100. No, the, the latest uncommitted value is 200. Oh, that's not right, This is uncommitted. Oh, okay. And then this points to the always the latest committed version. First writer wins, so nobody else can come and try to overwrite this from an uncommitted transaction. Okay. And then like the DIG is like $150 is the committed value. Yeah, so, so Biggie here, notorious BIG. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so Biggie here, uh, this has no, the version vector is, is null. So that means that there's no, old, there's no, uh, the committed version is exactly here in the main table space. If it's not null, then this is, this is uncommitted. If it is null, then it's committed. Yes? Uh, so when you, how can you handle complex joins in the uh, validation state? So this question is, how do you handle complex joins here? Well, you know, the join is empty, but uh, another write uh, breaks a uh, predicate of the complex join in your right. transaction report. All right, so this question is, how do I handle joins here, right? Uh, again, how do you do a join? Join is just an access method feeding into a join operator. So at the end of the day, you have a where clause that will determine what tuples you're actually reading from the, the base table. And whether you join after that or not doesn't matter. So you don't need to actually do the join. Oh, but the join is really likely that the join result is empty and your rights are breaking the predicate and the transaction is supported. Um, I think so. I think what you're saying is like if I if I I do a join, one table uh, produces no tuples, so therefore I don't do a I, I search, search, short circuit the join, then don't actually do the scan on the other side. Uh, yeah, I'm missing missing your example. So, for example, your you have very large credit. Yes. Um, but so one of the right on the on the right side breaks of one of the predicates. Okay. And the, the transaction is support. Yes. And what, that, what's wrong with that? But that, actually, it shouldn't be aborted. Why shouldn't it be aborted? Because it's it read nothing. Uh. No, I, I think you're confusing logical, logical tuples versus physical tuples. Logically, I should have read that tuple. Physically, I didn't because it, it wasn't there when I went to go read it. Again, th that, that would be a, a fan that would violate serializable ordering. So be very clear. We're doing this because we want to maintain serializability. So we don't want phantoms. Okay? Okay. Like I said, this is an old idea. It's very cool. The other cool thing about Hyper is this version synopsis. And again, Hyper is designed for maximizing performance or trying to improve performance for analytical queries. Uh, and so the issue with these version vectors is that we don't want to have to go check every single time as we go scan down, is this thing null or not? Right? We'll see this when we talk about query compilation and, and other uh, op optimizations for making queries run faster. Right? Don't 
Don't think about it in terms of like a, in a disk-based system, like who cares if I'm checking whether a pointer exists or not. If everything's already in memory, then I want to run as fast as possible and I want to generate, uh, I want to have my query have almost zero if clauses or zero branches. Because that's the fastest way to use modern CPUs. But now, if, if I'm doing a scan on this, on this table here, and every single time I gotta say, if this is null, do this, otherwise do that. Then that's gonna suck in terms of performance because the CPU is not gonna be able to predict or not do a very good job predicting what branch I'm gonna go down, right? So what they do is they add this additional column, this additional metadata to keep track of which portions of a block of data, when I think they store 10, 24 tuples per block, which offsets within, the block, within a block have a version pointer that's set to null or not, right? So my version synopsis for this block here is two to five. So if I treat all of these, these locations here as just offsets, then this is saying that outside this boundary of two to five, so zero to one and five to six, the version synopsis uh, is a stride of two tuples for both of these where the, 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 the version vector pointer is zero. So that means when I'm scanning along, and if I'm in this offset range, I don't need to check this thing at all. And that, that means that's, that's a code path during query execution I completely uh, ignore. And now I, know I have no if clauses, and now I'm gonna run much faster. And then for this range here, then I have to go check each one as, as I go along, the version vector. Yes? So now when you're updating the version vector pointer, do I need to log the version? Your, your question is, now if I update the version vector, do I also need to update this? Yeah, so yes. You'd have to log that as well, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so he says, if I update the version vector, do I have to lock this, latch, not a lock, if I have to latch this when I update it? Uh, yes, but you, again, this, this one you can do a atomic parent swap, right? Yeah. Again, the idea here is that we want to be able to find long strides of tuples where the version vector is null, and so therefore we don't have to check this. And that'll make our queries run much, much faster. Again, think of like, on a, think of like getting down to like instruction level optimizations, or cache level optimizations. That's one of the big things we're gonna focus, at when, focus on when we talk about analytical queries. Right? It's not about reading data from disk, it's how fast can we read crap uh, that's in memory. So uh, not having if branches when we scan these portions is make a big difference. All right, any questions about hyper? Okay, so let's jump into HANA. So HANA is the flagship MRE HTAP database system from SAP. SAP is a company. Uh, they have many databases. They bought, they bought Sybase a few years ago. They bought a, a ton of crap. Uh, but HANA is, is sort of the, the main go-to system now. Um, so it's an in-memory HTAP system that's going to do time travel storage with uh, newest to oldest ordering. Uh, like Hecaton, they're going to support both optimistic and pessimistic, pessimistic MVCC. I actually don't know what the default is. I think the paper you guys read last class, we said it was optimistic. And then the, 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 the Korean guys that work on this stuff told me, no, it's actually both. Um, so HANA's actually a, a sort of a, originally it was a Frankenstein of a bunch of different database systems that, that SAP bought. So P time actually came from South Korea. The South Korean, those guys are awesome for in-memory databases. Uh, P time is an awesome system that they bought. T Rex was a uh, search engine that they bought. MaxDB is another system that they bought. They mashed these things all together and called it HANA. Um, I actually don't know what HANA stands for. If you read Wikipedia, it stands for um, Hosno Plattner's new architecture. Hosno Plattner is the P in SAP, like it's three guys' names. So it's, he, he was really big in this, building this new system, so they named it after him. I don't know whether it's actually true or not. So it's also gonna support a hybrid storage layout with both rows and columns. This will make more sense in a few weeks when we, when we discuss all this. Um, and it's been around for a while. So the way they're gonna do version storage is that they're gonna store the oldest version in the main data table, and then the newest versions, uh, including uncommitted versions, will always be out in, in the version space, uh, in the time travel space. And then, unlike in Hecaton, where you stored whether a, um, the timestamp information about the visibility of a, or a tuple within the tuple themselves, they're gonna have a separate flag that says, I have older versions, go find where they are. 
And instead of using in, in hyper, we have a version vector that now points to where those versions are. They're going to maintain a separate hash table that'll map the record ID, a logical record ID for the tuple, to the, the head of the version chain. So it's, at a high level, it looks like this. So you have the main table space, right? You have this version flag that tells you whether there uh, exists older uncommitted versions for this tuple. Um, and then we have sort of the, 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 the latest committed version for the tuple. And then we have this hash table that'll map some logical record ID to the, the head of the version chain, and it's going from newest to oldest. So if I'm scanning along, and I, if I'm reading a tuple, and I check this, this flag, and if, it, if it's set to true, then it, if I want to find a, a, the newest version, I got to jump over here and, and find the version that way. Right? And they're doing this because they don't want to store you know, all the, the, the additional metadata in about the version over here. Yes? Is there a reason for having this oldest version here? This question is, why is the oldest version here and not the newest version, like in Hyper? No, that's but this is the oldest version. I actually, I don't, I actually don't know the answer. So this question is, why is this like the oldest version, and and why is this like N two O? I I don't I don't remember why. Because I think I think what happens is that they then transit. This is the row store version of this. They then transition it to the to the column store. But again, I don't. It's in the paper. Yes, it's actually, this is based on the paper you guys read for Wednesday. I'll double check this and I'll, I'll correct this on Wednesday. All right, so the other interesting thing about this is that, as I said, they're not going to store a, uh, a global state map like in Hecaton to say whether a transaction is committed or not. What they're going to instead do is store these sort of separate context objects that will tell you all the information about whether the t transaction that modified a particular tuple has, has, has been modified, or has been committed or not. So instead of now storing, the, again, the metadata, like the transaction ID, or inside of the, 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 the version itself, they're just going to store a 64-bit pointer to one of these transaction objects. So now if you want to figure out whether a transaction is committed or not, you follow that pointer. So there's no information about whether a version has been, is, is it was modified by a committed transaction inside the tuple itself. It's always in these separate transaction contexts. So let's say we have a transaction here, uh, and it gets timestamp 3, and does a write on C and write on D. So up here in the version stored space, these two guys will have, again, pointers to this transaction context. And then if you want to find out whether this thing's actually been written on the disk, they have something else called the group commit context that then additional metadata now that tells you whether all the transactions that are part of this group have been flushed out the disk or not. So it's sort of having these multiple layers of indirection to maintain state information about the transaction and whether it's been, been flushed to disk or not in the log out in these, these global objects rather than embedding them inside the, the, the versions themselves. And they do this to reduce space and reduce the overhead of you know, denoting that a transaction is committed. So again, let's say I do an update that updates a billion tuples. Instead of going through every single tuple, as I would in Hecaton and in the case of Hyper, flipping, you know, flipping those, those flags to say this thing has been committed or not, I just go down up to this and update this thing. So I think that's also too why they, they stored the oldest one here, because at some point this thing goes away and then you, you can migrate that over, over here. So I think that's the answer. So this is, again, another way of, of organizing the system and maintain, tracking all these different things so that uh, to reduce the overhead in a way that Hecaton uh, would be susceptible to. All right. So I want to finish up with now Cicada. Before we get into that, let's do some observations or, uh, about what are some of the other limitations we're seeing in, in these different systems. So the first is going to be MVCC. So in all the limitations we talked about so far, uh, the way they're going to keep track of different versions in the version chain is essentially through this indirection, right? We're going to have this version chain that you have to follow along to figure out, to find the right version that you want for your transaction. And, and you know, and a linked list is, uh, with data sort of scattered around in different memory locations on the heap, is going to be bad for cache locality because if I follow the version chain, I may be jumping around to different spots in memory, and I may be getting cache misses for, e for each of those. It's still in memory instead of on disk, but the difference between cache and you know, CPU caches and memory is still a lot. 
uh, to again reduce the this overhead, uh, reduce the size of the version chain from growing in, uh, uh, indefinitely, we have to use garbage collection in the background or, or cooperatively to clean things up, and that add, add, adds additional overhead. The other aspect in the case of hyper uh, to reduce the the need to update, uh, you know, a global space is that because they're losing, using local memory pools per thread, then you end up with a bunch of shared memory writes that are all around the heap. Again, increasing cache misses, increasing cache invalidations anytime we, we have to do any updates, and that's going to slow us down further. And then for all of these as well, we, they require a, a global shared counter to do timestamp allocation. right? And if you have a lot of cores and you're doing, doing atomic ads or comparing swaps and these things very quickly, then that's, that can slow things down because that's causing additional traffic on the actual underlying CPU architecture network or the bus to communicate between sockets. The next thing also to discuss is what are some of the limitations you have for implementing optimistic concurrent control. So Hackathon was optimistic, Hyper was optimistic, and SAP HANA as well was optimistic. So if you're under a, uh, if your workload has low contention, meaning transactions are updating different random tuples, then this is not a, you know, aborting won't be an issue because you wrote to something and I wrote to something, something completely different, who cares? But if there's high contention, which is very common in OLTP settings, where most of the trans transactions are trying to update a small portion of the database, then you're going to have aborts because you can't, you know, first writer wins and other problems, and therefore uh, transactions are going to, you know, get aborted and, and essentially do wasted work and have a lot of churn. For uh, for systems that are implementing true OCC, um, you have to copy the tuples from your from the global database into your private workspace, and that's additional memory writes. Uh, that that can you know, slow down performance. Like I want to be able to read data without having to do a write to, in order to read it. But in a lot of these systems, if you implement pure OCC, then you have you have to copy things so, so that you have repeatable reads. And the last one is a bit more nuanced and probably won't make sense right now, but it'll make sense uh, a week from now. Is that in order to make, ensure that we have uh, you no know, phantoms, if we have indexes, or to make sure that two transactions don't try to insert the same record into the same index at the same time under OCC, we have to install what are called virtual nodes. It's basically a placeholder in the index and say, I just inserted this key. I haven't really done it yet, but I'm going to you know, come back and later, and later on and actually update it for real. So this adds additional writes into a memory, which can slow us down, um, and can, limit, uh, can cause other contention issues in our indexes. Again, we'll cover index locking and gap locks and other things ne next week. So CMU, uh, there was a, a postdoc here at the CMU that worked with uh, Dave Anderson called Hyuntek Lim. He built his own execution engine, OTP engine, called Cicada. And this was trying, again, this was sort of expanding upon Hecaton and a bunch of other systems to try to make it work better for, for in-memory MVCC for pure OTP workloads. So he's not worried about OLAP stuff in the same way that Hyper and HANA is looking at pure OTP. So the paper sort of points out four key contributions, but I'm only going to cover the two ones I think are the most interesting. So they're going to do best effort inlining, meaning rather than have a version chain for every single tuple, you're going to try to inline the latest version or the, the next version with the tuple itself so that you don't have to follow the version chain to, you know, for, in most cases. They're going to apply techniques from distributed systems and have loosely synchronized clocks to do timestamp allocation. For that one, we don't need to worry about for now. Uh, uh, it's a good idea. At some point, we should discuss it in further detail, but for, for now, we can ignore it. They're going to do contention-aware validation, where and rather than just looking randomly to say, you know, what, who did I conflict with, or potentially conflict with, when I want to do validation, you can be slightly smarter and say, well, I'm more likely to conflict with this transaction over here for some reason, so let me validate against them first rather than just you know, looking through the list in the order that they were added. And then the last one I think is super interesting, I can't say too much about because I don't know whether it's a good idea, but they do it, uh, and I think it's something I want to pursue eventually in our own system, is that they store the index nodes in the, time, in the tables themselves rather than just in the heap. And I'm gonna, I'll explain what that is in a second. So here's what, here's what best effort inlining works. So the, the metadata about the tuple itself is stored in a, um, in a fixed location. So the idea here is that in most of the times, 
you don't need to go follow the version chain because you probably only need to see the like the latest version. So rather than uh, you know having a, a pointer point to some other version somewhere in the heap, you just embed directly inside of this thing, the inside the tuple itself, the next version. So the way you think about this, you could store like the tuple itself over here, right, the, the latest version, and then you have a little extra space to say here's the next version. So you're packing like two versions together with each other, right? And you can selectively do this based on um, you know, how often do you think you need to traverse the version chain? Right, because this gets tricky now because this could potentially be, well, I guess this is always fixed length, so this is, this is not an issue. Um, so again, this is sort of like, uh, you wouldn't want to do this in, in Hyper because Hyper is a column store, right? This is purely for a row store. You, you can do something like this. All right, now when it comes time to do uh, validation, uh, there's three sort of optimizations we can do. So for the first one, we can be aware of what contention might exist, or what conflicts might exist uh, for other transactions that ran at the same time. And so again, rather than comparing their, their, their read sets in just primary key order, you can try to maybe reorder them based on their write timestamps. So you look at, say, transactions that are, uh, have written something more recently are I'm more likely to conflict with. So for, I want to check the, them first. Right? And by doing the timestamps, if everyone checks in the right same timestamp order, you never have any deadlocks because everyone's always going in the same direction. Right? The standard technique is you use primary key order. Right? Everyone checks A, and then B, and then C. This one you go in timestamp order. The next thing you can do is that before you go ahead and make any, uh, uh, during the validation phase, before you go ahead and apply any global rights to share data structures or, or the, the share table space, you may just go ahead and peek ahead and say, well, am I actually going to abort with any transaction that's running right now? So you can keep track of what, what tuples, what tables transactions are often conflicting on and therefore having to abort. So do like a pre-validation to see whether I would, I'm going to abort later on. So the idea here is then rather than waiting to the very end of the transaction, then do validation and just to find out the first query I did caused a problem that I had to roll back. Maybe if I check immediately after I do the first query, and I, I can kill myself ahead of time. The last one is that uh, instead of always having to do a complete search in the version list, I can keep a little extra uh, uh, table on the side or hash, hash map on the side that says, oh, if you're looking at this tuple, here's how to jump to the, the, the last tuple, the last version you probably really want. Right? And again, the idea here is that you, you identify which tuples cause a lot of cache misses or a lot of long version change traversals, and you just have a little, little index to jump ahead more quickly. So for these first two here, you essentially want to skip these if most of your transactions recently have committed successfully. right? Because this is extra work you have to do that will slow down transactions under normal execution. Like checking to see whether I'm going to val validate immediately after I do a, uh, an update query. I'm going to do that later on again when, when I do validation. So rather than delay, you know, doing it twice or having the transaction take longer because I'm doing this extra step, if I know I'm not likely to abort, then I just skip it. This last one here, this is sort of like a, a you would do this anyway, and this again just re reduces contention. All right, the last thing I want to talk about too is the, for the, is the index storage. And again, the, the as I said, as far as I know, SQLite actually might do something similar. I need, I need to check with him, um, with Richard, the guy that implements it, to see whether this is true or not. But as far as I know, maybe I missed it in the paper. Nobody actually does this. So the, normally what people do when you do an in-memory index is that these things are just sitting in the heap. I just, I just malloc a bunch of blocks. I keep track of where they are. And, but the, there's, you know, there's sort of separate regions of memory. That's separate from the, the fixed length or the, or the very length data pool for tuples. But in Cicada, what they're actually going to do is the, two, the, the, the nodes themselves in the index are just mapped to actually tuples in, in a table. So there's a special table called the index table for, for a regular logical table. And these things are just, uh, in case of Cicada, they're just blobs where they're packing in the binary version of, of the actual node itself in the index. Right? Again, the index nodes are just if it's just on the heap, it's just an offset to some memory, and you know how to interpret the, the bytes inside of that. 
Same thing, if it's a blob, I know how to jump to the offset of where this thing is actually being stored, and I can then interpret the bytes. So what's really interesting about this is that you get phantom avoidance for free, I think, or so they claim. So I'm already doing phantom detection in the ways we talked about before for my regular tuples. And then if I want to do phantom detection for any kind of index scans, I either have to do the predicate uh, precision locking from hyper, or I have to do gap locks, or uh, uh, next key locks, we'll see next, next week, on, you know, on the B plus tree. But if I pack the, the, the nodes of the index inside the table themselves, if I'm already doing validation or for phantoms on this, then I get it for free for, for tuples, or sorry, for indexes. So I'm doing validation for, for, for tuples and the regular table. If I do the same kind of validation for the nodes that are packed inside the, t the table, I get it for free. So that means I don't have to have some extra separate code to handle indexes in a special way. Indexes are just another table. So I think that's really cool. I think it might work. I don't know whether that's actually a good idea or not. Um, and so what they do is they actually, I guess, as I said, the, the node itself, the data about the node is just a blob. But you can imagine you could break out the keys and the pointers or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever metadata you're maintaining inside of a node itself as separate columns and maybe do even more fine grain validation the same way that the hyper guys do in precision locking. Right? So actually, be clear, you still need precision locking to make this work, but you're already doing that for tables, so you just do the same thing for, for indexes. But again, they treat this as a blob, so it's very coarse grain, but you could imagine you know, breaking up the actual metadata per, on a per column basis. So like I said, I don't know anybody else that does this. I think it's really cool. Uh, it'd be an interesting research paper to see whether this actually is a good idea or not. It's one of those things where like, it's in the paper, it's just like one or two paragraphs, it's like, oh, by the way, we did this. Uh, and they didn't really explore it in further detail. And this is like the second year I've said this now. I, I think this is something we should look into. But that's an aside. All right, let's finish up real quick. Let's look at some, some results here. So the, 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 the postdoc that implemented Cicada was an amazing hacker. He also implemented all the latest versions of OCC and MVCC systems uh, that were available. So we're going to compare against Silo and, and a sort of a, a improvement of Silo, which came out of Harvard. So we'll see this, uh, the Silo system later on when we talk about logging. Um, it's a very influential system. TikTok is a, another OCC system that I was involved with with a PhD student back at MIT. Um, Photos came out of HP Labs. Hackathon we've already covered. Ermia is an improvement over Silo out of Toronto. Um, and then Cicada is this particular system here. So for this work, first workload, we're doing YCSB uh, with almost no contention. Every transaction is going to read or write a single tuple. So in this environment, the, the modern implementations, uh, so TikTok, uh, the improved version of Silo, uh, and Photos, and Cicada, all these guys scale really well. These other ones flatline over here. I forget why, I think this version of, this is what? This is, this is Hecaton. Yeah, that's sort of crapping out. Ermia is crapping out here. And then 2PL is looking a lot like we saw before in the other, when we talked about lock thrashing. So that's what's going on there. So this is not that interesting, right? This is, this is low contention. This is sort of the best case scenario for all these protocols. So let's look at now under high contention. So this is running the TPCC work workload with one warehouse. So again, you'll become very familiar with TPCC by the end of the semester. It's the standard benchmark people use for OTP systems. So the way it's basically modeled, think of like, it's like the Amazon storefront, uh, and one warehouse has, has a district, and a district, district has customers, customers have orders, orders have order items. It's like this tree structure. Think of like an order processing system. So with one warehouse, that means almost every single transaction is trying to update that one tuple. Right? It's super, super high contention. So everyone performs terrible, uh, except for Cicada, does a little bit better. Um, and my system was where? Uh, the purple one, so here, there's, there's us, sort of near the bottom. I'm okay with that. Um, and again, the, in the paper they discuss how it's a combination of all the various optimizations they talked about to specifically handle high contention workloads. The inlining, the, the early validation, all of those extra steps you can do to allow Transactions are, are going to abort anyway, right? There's, there's no magic to make transactions when they conflict to make them not conflict, right? That's just going to happen. The question is really about what can you do to reduce the amount of wasted work you have to do 
four transactions that are going to abort. You remember the graph from the, from the, the, the staring to the, the abyss paper, right? They showed under high contention most of the transactions, most of the, at a thousand core count, most of the, 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 the protocols are spending their time aborting transactions. So all the extra stuff that Cicada does allows them to get, uh, you know, achieve a little bit better performance than the other ones, right? Again, the question is which percent, what percentage can be attributed to different things? How much can be attributed to the, the index storage stuff that we talked about? I don't know. We have to go, uh, to go look at the paper again. All right, any questions about Cicada? So again, what was today about? Today was about looking at uh, different implementations of FECC. We saw how they checked for phantoms in different ways. We saw how they organized the version change in different ways. We saw after the hackathon initial ha hackathon discussion, we saw a bunch of optimizations to improve MCC to make it run better for different workloads. So we saw in HANA, they, they store global transaction contexts to not have to update all the single tuples. We saw in the case of Hyper, the version vector storage, uh, the, fan, the precision locking, and the version synopsis are better for doing analytical queries. And for Cicada, we saw a bunch of tricks that make, make OHP queries run better. Okay? So again, there's, there's, there's no one system that does all the amazing tricks that we're talking about. It's, it's our job to understand which ones are actually worth pursuing, right? Because we can only implement so many things. So which ones should, should we give high priority to? And it depends on what kind of workload you want to target. Okay? All right, any questions? All right, the reading from Wednesday is the SAP HANA paper on garbage collection. It's an okay paper. There'll be typos, you will see them. Uh, it's from the industrial track, uh, which the, the reviewing bar is a little bit lower. But in my opinion, it, it is a good paper because uh, it does cover all the different de sub-design decisions you have about garbage collection and way deeper than what we discussed so far. And um, for the most part, it's pretty straightforward to understand. It actually was probably the only MVCC garbage collection paper that's out there. That's why I picked it. Okay? All right, guys. Uh, have a good, 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 have a Cause ain't eyes and said the pain eyes red You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head Take back the pack of duds They gon' get you some same knives and drink it to the studs Billy D is the chili cheese, so down with the weak guys Be a man and get a can of snake eyes